Welcome back to The Breakfast on PLUS TV Africa. We head straight to our first major conversation where we look at an open letter by former President Olusha Gunobasanjo. And in the content of that letter, he talked about the fact that he has no hatred for the Niger Delta people, as been claimed by stakeholder, uh, other statesman Edwin Clark. Right. Uh, and to make sense of all of this, we have uh, two fine gentlemen who will be joining the conversation, Victor Kai. He's a public affairs analyst and Nika Gule. Good morning, gentlemen, and thank you for joining us this morning. Victor Kai, good morning. Can you hear us? Good morning, baby, but uh, I'll try. <laughs> All right, thank you for joining us. So, so let's, let's start off with the... I'm sure you have actually seen or read the letter, open letter of former president Olusha Gunobasanjo to the elder states person talking about Edwin Clark saying he has no hatred for the region and uh, this is as a result of the fact that he said that the oil of the Niger Delta does not just belong only to the Niger Delta region but belongs to Nigerians. But let's share your thoughts on that letter. What are your thoughts? Fine. I'm listening to the arguments uh, of both parties and um, to a very large extent, if we were to take away uh, sentiment, one would have to agree that um, Obasanjo has a superior argument. And the reason is simply that, um, yes, the resources are found in one part of the country, uh, but everything that is within the Federation belongs to the country. It's like a company, for instance. Whatever happens in one division, no matter the revenue that comes from one division, um, it's revenue for the entire group. Um, so, it, it, to that extent, I would say, and, and again, in line with the Constitution, that the messenger has, I mean, is quite right in his argument. The only other thing to be said is um, the fact that um, I think that the other statesman, that was speaking out of, I would say, sentiment, justifiably so too, because you don't plunder the resources of an area and then leave the city uh, ravaged the way the Niger Delta has been. And it's been fairly treated over the years. Otherwise, no one would complain. And so I think the reason for the agitation and the reason for um, the fact that that part of the country feels the way it feels is because, um, yes, although the resources belong to the whole of the country, you do not, um, I mean, you don't kill the, the goose that lays the golden egg, which is practically what is happening to people in that area. If you go to Patakot, for instance, they shoot, six, six shoot in the air. I mean, you begin to break, and this has impact on the environment. And over the years, even if you don't see it right now, but over the years, you might find a situation where you begin to get children born, uh, deformed, and begin to get all sorts of sicknesses and diseases, which Evidently, which means that, uh, you know, it's, it, I think it's really fair that uh, the people in that area are properly and uh, adequately compensated. And there must be a suitable share of these resources as well. If you go to where in the Niger Delta where these resources are gotten from, and then you go to a place like Abuja that produces almost nothing, and you look at the level of development, then you will understand where the other state money is coming from. Yeah. Um, all right. Let, let's also hear from Nick Agule this morning. Uh, Mr. Agule, can you hear us clearly? Yes, I can hear you. Okay, can you welcome. Hear me? Yes, we can clearly. Um, so let, let's also have you share your thoughts on um, uh, Edwin Clark's uh, argument. Um, you know, and of course, he also got to mention. You know, Basin just responded. He also got to mention. You know, the Zamfara State example. And the fact that, you know, there's gold mining going on in Zamfara State that doesn't seem to be going into the Federation's coffers. Um, and, of course, he also looked back at, the, you know, when oil was found in Oloi Biri sometime in 1957, you know, and the agreement that the country had then, you know, with regard sharing of the proceeds uh, from that uh, oil. Um, so do you think that, you know, um, Elder Statesman L, um, Edwin Clark does have a point that he's making and we maybe should, you know, take, you know, a lot more seriously. Well, thank you very much uh, for that question. Uh, before I answer your question, let me say that my own view on this uh, brickbat 
between the two elder statesmen of Nigeria, uh, uh, Chief Obasanjo and Chief Edwin Clark, is that it is disappointing. Uh, these people have both said they, was, they served in the federal cabinet of Nigeria in 1975. That is 46 years ago. And I mean, there are countries where 46 year olds have become presidents. So if these people have been at the helm of affairs in Nigeria for 46 years, and today Nigeria is you know, involved in all sorts of myriad of issues, these people have to be taking responsibility for contributing to where Nigeria is today because they have had the opportunities in the past to make Nigeria a greater nation than it is today. So for me, that's, that's my view about what these elder statesmen are, are, are speaking about. Uh, also, I want to say that we need to deal with first things first. Before we even come to who owns the mineral resources that are in the ground. Let us look at the situation today. The Niger Delta region, every month, gets 13% derivation. There is the Niger Delta Development Commission, NGDC. There is the Ministry for Niger Delta Affairs. Then there is all sorts of social, corporate social responsibility projects or monies from oil operating companies into the region. But if you go to the Niger Delta today, go to the creeks of the Niger Delta, go to where the oil is being produced. I worked in the oil industry in Nigeria for over 10 years. Go to the real places where the oil is being produced. If you look at the quality of life in those places, you will weep if all these monies that I have mentioned, 30% derivation, all the budgets of the Niger Delta states put together, NDDC, Ministry for Niger Delta uh, Affairs. If these interventions were going directly to those who need them, the Niger Delta region today will be like a Dubai because development will be there for the people. But we are not seeing that. And because we are not seeing that, then it doesn't matter whether 100% of the money goes to the Niger Delta or is 50% or is 30% as the elder statesmen are debating. The lives of the Niger Delta people, the real Niger Delta people is not going to change. And for me, that should be what should be occupying the time of this elder statesmen. They should be asking the questions about what is happening to the huge intervention funds that are meant for the Niger Delta. We can't be pumping this money into a region and year in, year out, the lives of the people are not changing. The people are still living in polluted waters, living in, 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 uh, in ramshackled, you know, touched houses, no electricity, no pipe on water, no education, no health care for their people. Port Harcourt is not Niger Delta. If you want to know Niger Delta, go to where the oil wells are. I was there, I spent my time you know, working for oil companies in those places. So for me, I think the the the, the elder states may need to divert their attention. But but, but let's let's also let's also look at this. Uh, the argument that you are putting out now is that whether or not I mean we should be looking at how they have been how they have fared in managing, uh, you know, the thirteen percent that has been allocated to them. It's like saying, I mean, for some of the artifacts that you have. Uh, some of this Western world take from African countries. And because um, we Africans are careless, we cannot manage our resource, it therefore means that they should keep it. Uh, don't you think that whether or not they are managing it, what, I mean, uh, the cost that they are fighting for is, should be justified? I, I really don't, whether or not they are able to manage, I mean, it feels like you have children and then you give them uh, one 1,000 error, whatever happens with the 1,000 error. Uh, you're saying, okay, because you haven't managed the 1,000 and you're supposed to get 1,000, I'm going to reduce it because you don't manage the 1,000 that I've given. And so I'm therefore going to reduce it to 500 Naira. Uh, it feels like that's the argument that you're putting out this morning. It's not the argument I'm putting forward. If I use your analogy, if you have children and you give them 1,000 Naira and they are not managing that 1,000 Naira, what I'm saying is that your attention should be on getting these children to manage the 1,000 very well. When they get to the point where they can manage that 1,000 very well, then you know you are going to give them 10,000. You are going to give them a million. 
But because they are not managing this 1,000 very well, even if you give them 1 million or even a billion, you can be rest assured that they are not going to manage it very well. So this is the argument I'm putting forward. You know, and that is not to say that I don't support that the regions where mineral resources are embedded in Nigeria should not have a lion's share of the cake. I am actually a, a federalist. I, I believe in a, in the in, in a federation because Nigeria, even the name Nigeria is a scam because we call ourselves the Federal Republic of Nigeria but we are actually operating a unitary system of government. If that is not a scam, I need someone to tell me the definition of a scam. When I call myself something that I am not, for each region, being responsible for their resources, because to Nigeria, the current system now, where governors go to Abuja every month to go and take money that is largely coming from the oil industry that they have no knowledge of. There are governors in Nigeria who don't know what a Christmas tree is. If you ask them what is a Christmas tree, they may be telling you Christmas or 25th December. They will not even know it's related to the oil industry. But these governors take this money to their states, and what do they do with it? They just squander it. But if the governors were ready to tap from the resources that are embedded in their... Look, there is no state in Nigeria that is not viable. If a state does not have rich agricultural land and a good climate to match, they have tourist potential, or they have mineral resources, or they have all of those that I'm mentioning. And if the governors pay attention to unlock value from these things, then Nigeria will develop because there's no way, like I am from, from Benue State. If my governor pays attention to agriculture, which will have comparative advantage, there is no way he can have industrial mechanized agriculture without employing the jobless youth that are on the street today. So that is the kind of value that will be created if every governor spends time to think about how they will unlock resources from themselves. This whole feeding bottle mentality of getting money from the oil wells of Nigeria, taking it to Abuja, and then some spoiled kids, 36 of them, every month go to Abuja to take money is not the right way to go. And that is what has pinned us down in underdevelopment. But that is not to say that our elder statesmen should not be questioning what is happening to the current money that are going to the Niger Delta. And to that point, I think uh, people like Edwin Clark should be examining and asking and, and raising protests and calling the governors of the Niger Delta to order to say what's happening to the humongous budget that you guys declare year in, year out, and the people in the creeks are not having their lives changed. Well, Mr. Gole, um, and I'm sure a lot of people would agree that those are very, very important questions, you know, and we've spoken about this, you know, numerous times, um, how nobody seems to be holding the leaders of the Niger Delta uh, to account with regards to billions of Naira that are sent uh, through the NDDC, the Ministry of Niger Delta Affairs, the governors and their allocations monthly, security votes, um, and the billions that they also receive from the Federation accounts, you know, every month. Um, it doesn't seem like a lot of questions are going in that direction. Um, but, you know, there's also, you know, some sentiments towards uh, the 1963 constitution that was mentioned in this back and forth between uh, Olushiko Basanjo and Chief um, Edwin Clark. Um, so I, I want us, you know, to talk about, you know, a little bit of uh, some analysis on that um, um, aspect. Um, the 1963 constitution basically, you know, states... Um, that the oil and the resources under the ground belong to the Federation. And, uh, you know, Lushiko, um, former President Obasanjo also stated that, reminding Ed Edwin Clark. Um, but why do you think that isn't also playing out in Zamfara State, like, the, like I asked earlier? Um, why aren't we having the same, you know, attention and focus and earning money from the gold in Zamfara as we are in the Niger Delta? I think you have touched on the raw nerve in the Federation of Nigeria. There are certain things in Nigeria that are not right, that need to be corrected. And this Zamfara gold mine, as with the mining of minerals across the nation, is concerned. Like I said, I'm from Benue State. 
we have the Benway Cement, the former Benway Cement Company, which is now the Dan Gote Cement. The, the, the limestone is in the ground. It's been extracted and converted into cement. But I have never heard of, you know, monies from that extraction going to the Federation account where it is shared to all the 36 states of the Federation. So Nigeria cannot progress if we continue to allow this kind of inequitable and unfair practices to continue. What is good for the goose is good for the gander. If the oil in the Niger Delta is feeding the 36 states of the Federation, so must all the minerals that have been extracted in anywhere in Nigeria also be feeding the 36 states. If that is not happening, then it, 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 it's going to cause um, uh, anxieties and it's going to cause uh, all sorts of issues, which is what we're talking about here. So I am in full support that until our constitution changes to a true federal constitution, where each of the regions, states as it, as it, may, as it may be, are in control of the resources embedded in their grounds, then every mineral resource extracted anywhere on the surface of Nigeria, including the Zamfara gold, must be fed into the Federation account. Until we do that, then we are going to have these issues. Okay, so as part of the, um, also some part of the letter, uh, the president, former president is quoted to say that negotiations would actually, you know, yield better results than dictation. Uh, what kind of negotiations should the Niger Delta, or what kind of negotiations should the country be involved in at this point in time as regards resource control or the oil well, who has what and not? So for me, these are the issues that I would like the, the likes of the elder statesman, Edwin Clark, to tackle. Okay, we have a democracy now. And I believe that with careful planning and execution of agitation, you will be able to get things done, even with this democracy that we have now. So the states in the Niger Delta, each of them have three senators in the Senate. They also have five, six, seven, probably 10 House of Rep members in the House of Representatives. Why is it that the likes of Edwin Clark, instead of engaging in letter writing, summon all the senators from the Niger Delta, all the House of Rep members in the Niger Delta, and read the Royal Act to them and says, look, you will lose the support of the people if you don't go back to the Niger Delta and put bills on the table that will enable the Niger Delta and every other region in Nigeria or state begin to control their resources. Let us do this thing through the constitutional way, which is the most legitimate and legal way to get changes done in Nigeria. And if these senators and House of Rep members don't abide to what the people are saying, then Edwin Clark should lead a movement to recall members of the National Assembly from the Niger Delta. This is how you use democracy to get things done. They, and when these members not, realize that they are Mr. Agule, is going to be a done deal, yes. Mr. Agule, I don't think that this is likely to happen. You know, but even if we get there, they still don't have the numbers to do that. Um, you know, in, in the Niger Delta. And of course, in, even if you, you, you want to put, you know, most of the senators or representatives um, from uh, the South-South, they still don't have the numbers to do that. They can lobby. Um, but of course, you, I'm, I'm sure you're also aware, you know, of what has been, you know, stated in the past about the unfair figures in the National Assembly. Um, and that's a totally different conversation entirely. But they still, they do not have the numbers to do that. Um, in any way. And so it, it might be a little harsh to ask that they be recalled if they're not able to convince the National Assembly to have a constitutional review uh, that puts these things in place. You have a point, but let's look at it from two perspectives. The first perspective is that we cannot continue talking and writing letters. Let's have that bill or those bills on the table of the National Assembly. Let it go down in history that members of the National Assembly from the Niger Delta or any other region in Nigeria that is agitating, including the Southeast and everywhere, have placed bills on the table of the National Assembly and the bills did not scale through. At least let us have that in history. But then don't be surprised that there are all sorts of agitations around the country, all sorts of agitations. And you won't be surprised that if a particular section of the country like the Niger Delta or Southeast, someone there 
they are, they, are, they are members of the National Assembly, and they place bills on the table. You might be surprised that other regions will back those bills because they too have agitations in their mind. You have to try something and fail. You don't just try because you think you're not going to succeed. We will never succeed at anything except we try it. Those who have built aeroplanes today, the jumbo planes that we are, we are, we are flying today, they have to try it before they succeeded. If they thought about the enormity of the issue that a flight can cause and all of that, we will still be tracking today. So I, think, I, I still believe that the, Edwin Clark and co should use the constitutional means we have today. Let them try and let them fail and let history record that. But, but shouldn't we be more concerned, just like you have mentioned, about um, what we're getting now? Uh, how far have these governors been managing what they get from the uh, Federation account? Shouldn't we, we be more concerned about that than, rather than asking for uh, resource control? Because at the end of the day, you say that um, mismanagement is always an issue. And so if you look at it, you want to look at the development across, you know, the entire region. How far have we fared? So maybe we just, you know, ignore that entirely and stay focused with what they're getting and see how they can actually translate that before we start talking about um, having, you know, controlling our resources as states. I agree with you. I agree with you that we can take this thing in stages or even in parallel. I mean, we can do multitasking. So nothing stops Edwin Clark and the Ijo National Congress and all of those pressure movements in the Niger Delta to begin to examine and cross-examine and, in, and do inquisition of their governors or what is happening to the budgets, the humongous, look, some of the Niger data uh, states, they are declaring budgets that are up to 10 years, the budget of other states in Nigeria, Niger data state government. So they should be asking those questions about where that money is going. Where is the 13% going? Where is the NDDC going? Where is Federal Minister of Niger data going? Those questions must be asked, but that, that doesn't stop a more sustainable solution to it, which is using constitutional means to actually operate a true federation in Nigeria. There are many, many states in Nigeria that will be far better than what they are today if we're actually a federalist nation, if we're operating true federalism. So I, I agree with you that it, it shouldn't be one or. We can do both, push them together. Yeah, all right. Well, let's bring back Victor Okai um, uh, into the conversation. Um, I, I want you to also speak, you know, with regards to the same thing. You know, a part of um, uh, from President Olusegun Basinjo's letter says here, um, the constitution that affects the Niger Delta region affects Zamfara State, where gold is found. Um, and if anybody in, at the federal level has um, remissed in implementing the constitution, then that's a different matter. He goes on to say that the gold in Ilesha Oshun State. Mm -hmm. Or Shun State, I beg your pardon, and the lead in Ebony State all come under the same law and constitution, um, and you know further. So, Victor Okai, I want you to speak in response to why the current Nigerian government and you know the Nigeria as a country rather is not taking advantage of the other mineral resources that are found in different parts of the country, including in Enugu State, where there you know used to be coal. Um, why isn't Nigeria taking advantage of those mineral resources and generating more funds? Why isn't that one of the things that, you know, the, that any government comes into power and, you know, even puts up as part of their campaign promises? Um, uh, Victor Okai. Well, I guess, yeah, I guess the answer is obvious. Um, normally, you hope for the lowest hanging fruits first. And if it happens with more lucrative, <laughs> It makes you participate in the language even lazier. You know, with petroleum, uh, this is liquid gold. And it's, um, I mean, you can, you can imagine most of our resources come from there. So, I mean, but there are countries that live the same way we live off petroleum, we live entirely off gold. And we have as much mineral resources in this country, largely on top as these other ones. So, I guess we have to say that we have a government that is very lazy, very unimaginative, and, uh, you know, we just take the easy way out, which is just go for petroleum and then leave, leave the Chinese to plunder the gold in Zamfara, for instance, and 
you know, and private uh, uh, individuals and unscrupulous politicians who would rather that the rest of us are not aware of what is going on there. So we're, we're, that, that's exactly what's happening. Um, unfortunately, oil was discovered a very large quantity first. If we had started with gold, like uh, Ghana, for instance, we probably would have done better if oil had come later. You know, I, it, I mean, if you ask me, I really wish we had started with something like gold. You know, um, we would have been the better for it now, because oil would just have been an addition, not an alternative. You know, which there's, is, there's also what it is. Now. Oil is the main thing. Gold is just on the side. And it's not fair because this country should be richer than it is right now. We shouldn't be taking the loans that we're taking right now, you know. We should be able to have better infrastructure right now if we're able to tap these other resources that are bound in very huge commercial and sustainable quantities across the length and breadth of this picture. Oh, these challenges are, you know, more than 50 years, you know, running. Um, you know, and we, we could have had, you know, this same conversation 20 years ago and had, you know, pretty much the same conclusions. Um, but Victor Kai, uh, just before we go, I want you to also say, um, uh, speak on something. The, the um, allegations by Chief Edwin Clark, you know, to former President Olusha Gorbassanjo are that he seems to have um, some sort of, you know, issues with the Niger Delta or hatred for the Niger Delta. Um, but I want you to speak with regards the OD incident that um, occurred during former President Olusha Obasanjo's uh, time, does he have the somehow moral justification to claim to love the people of the Niger Delta, you know, without a proper apology to people of the Niger Delta after the incident in OD? So what are you talking about? Is it OD or what? Yes. Okay. Um... You know, unfortunately, the military is trained only one way. Whether an army man is in uniform or out of uniform, he's only trained to kill. I mean, so when they, whether or whatever started in at OD, when they killed some military men, I think if I recall, uh, the only solution for them was to use a hammer to kill a fly. It is unfortunate, uh, but remember, the same thing happened at Zach uh, That was uh, the natural reaction of the man in uniform. And that was what Ambassador George did. To uh, use that and say that uh, he has a, a morbid hatred for the Niger Delta people would not be fair because uh, he also picked the son of the Niger Delta uh, as vice president and eventually as president of, of Nigeria. You know, so. It, if anything, he has done that much for the Niger Delta. So I do not think that that uh, accusation is, is fair. I think it is unfounded. And I think that um, the two old men have their private beef and they should not drag us into it. All right. I, I just uh, thought it would be interesting to throw that bit into it. Thank you very much, Victor Okai, for your time this morning. Nika Gule also, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, we enjoy speaking with you both always. Have a great day. All right, and uh, we'll go on a short break and move away from the conversation on the Niger Delta, Edwin Clark and Ulisha Gorbassanjo. And then we're going to be talking about Nigeria's power sector now, um, still having similar challenges that we've had decades ago. Where does the power sector go next? We'll talk about it when we come back. <laughs>